So this didn't make the show last week, but I had to talk about it because even for Tucker Carlson, this is pretty brazen. This is very, very brazen. So on national television, the most popular news pundit in America is literally going to recite the Great Replacement Theory, which for those of you unaware, is a white supremacist conspiracy theory that has literally fueled mass shootings. But Tucker Carlson is going to casually promote this idea on national television. Now, I know that the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement, if you suggest that the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, mm. with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's, that's what's happening, actually. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. Mm. If, if, look, mm. if this was happening in your house, if you were in sixth grade, for example, and without telling you, your, kid, your parents adopted a bunch of new siblings and gave them brand new bikes and let them stay mm. up later and help them with their homework and gave them twice the allowance that they gave you, you would say to your siblings, you know, I think we're being replaced by, by kids that our parents love more. And it would be kind of hard to argue against you because look at the evidence. So right. this matters on a bunch of different levels, but on the most basic level, it's a voting rights question. In a democracy, one person equals one vote. If you change the population, you dilute the political power of the people who live there. So every time they import a new voter, I become disenfranchised as a mm. current voter. So I don't mm. understand why we don't understand this. I mean, everyone wants to make a racial issue out of it. Ooh, the you know, white replacement theory. No, no, no. This is a voting rights question. I have less political power because they're importing a brand new electorate. Why should I sit back and take that? The power that I have yeah. as an American guaranteed at birth is one man, one vote, and they're diluting it. No, they're not allowed to do that. Why are we putting up with this? He is one step away from just outright calling for a white ethno state. And if he did, I honestly wouldn't be surprised. And you could already anticipate the way he'd respond. Oh, well, those who are criticizing me for saying that whites should have their own country that is, you know, to the exclusion of black and brown people. They're just trying to be hyper woke and all this nonsense. But I, I mean, you and I know that this is the truth, right? The fact that they're trying to criticize me is more evidence that I'm correct. I mean, wow. Again, even for Tucker Carlson, he's really just, he's saying the quiet part out loud and he knows that he can get away with whatever he wants because regardless of how disgusting the rhetoric he's used, regardless of how explicit his white supremacy is, there hasn't been much backlash. I mean, what, advertisers pull ads from Fox News for a week or so? And then they're right back to it. He brings in ratings for Fox News, so they're not going to get rid of him. In fact, they just gave him another show. He says uh, the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the white electorate, by the way, with new, more obedient voters from the third world, as if acquiring citizenship and the ability to vote is that easy. I mean, if you're an actual American citizen, it's already Fairly difficult to vote in America. In Georgia, they just created a voter suppression law that makes it more difficult for black Georgians to vote. And yet he thinks that it's so easy to just import voters from the third world. And he says, if you change the population, you dilute the political power of the people who live here. So every time they import a new voter, I become disenfranchised as a current voter. So let me just put things into perspective. We have a government that is bought and paid for by corporate America. And there's been study after study that shows that Americans have zero impact on policy outcomes. But what Tucker Carlson is worried about is that more black and brown people are going to be voting. That's the threat. It's that brown votes are diluting white votes. It's not corporations. But yet, this is about voting rights. He cares about democracy. Well, if you actually cared about democracy and voting rights, I wouldn't necessarily be focusing on this issue. I'd be focusing on getting money out of politics, decommodifying elections. But we know what this is about. This isn't about voting rights. This is about white supremacy. An individual who claimed that immigrants are making America dirtier, I don't think you have to dive that deep to try to find out what his underlying agenda is. And notice how he asks, why are we putting up with this? And this almost sounds like an implicit call to action to white supremacists, 
But here's the thing. The great replacement theory inherently is a call to action. This is part of the reason why white supremacists have carried out mass shootings. As Media Matters explains, the Great Replacement Theory has inspired a bloody trail of horrific events across the world. The racist mass shooters in both Christchurch, New Zealand, and El Paso, Texas, wrote of their belief in the theory. The neo-Nazis who marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, did so to chants of Jews will not replace us and you will not replace us. These events shocked people around the globe, but the beliefs that motivated them are not confined to the dark corners of online message boards. They are increasingly present in the mainstream right-wing lexicon especially where Carlson is involved. Following the murder of 51 people in a New Zealand mosque, Nathan Robinson in The Guardian pointed to the striking parallels between Carlson's own writing and the writing of the shooter in his manifesto. This is what Nathan J. Robinson writes. Here, for example, in a passage from Carlson's most recent book on the topic of why diversity makes us weaker, he writes, quote, when confronted or pressed for details, proponents of diversity retreat into a familiar platitude, which they repeat like a Zen cone. Diversity is our strength, but is diversity our strength? The less we have in common, the stronger we are. Is that true of families? Is it true in neighborhoods or businesses? Of course not. Then why is it true of America? Nobody knows. Nobody's even allowed to ask the question. And here is an excerpt from the manifesto issued by the man who killed 51 people in a New Zealand mosque. Why is diversity said to be our greatest strength? Does anyone even ask why? It is spoken like a mantra and repeated ad infinitum, but no one ever seems to give a reason why. What gives a nation strength? And how does diversity increase that strength? What part of diversity causes this increase in strength, no one can give an answer. The resemblance there is uncanny. It's almost like Tucker Carlson is inspiring these white supremacists. He's legitimizing and validating their white supremacist worldviews. And the El Paso shooter in his manifesto also referenced the Great Replacement. Now, people are going to say, well, sure, the, these crazy folks, they're going to, they're going to, you know, justify whatever. These are deranged people. Right? It doesn't matter what Tucker Carlson says. Really, individual responsibility is what matters most. You know, if they're the ones that take up violence, then, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that Tucker Carlson is a white supremacist because he may or may not be, you know, inspiring white supremacists. But when you juxtapose Tucker Carlson's rhetoric with the rhetoric of white supremacists and actual neo Nazis, you're going to see that the resemblance is very, very similar. Take a look at this compilation that Media Matters put together. Diversity is our strength, they screech, as if that settles the conversation by itself, like a magic talisman. Diversity, we hear about it nonstop. It's the mainstream motto. How precisely is diversity our strength? Since you've made this our new national motto, please be specific as you explain it. Can you think, for example, of other institutions, such as, I don't know, marriage or military units, in which the less people have in common, the more cohesive they are. Do you get along better with your neighbors or your coworkers if you can't understand each other or share no common values? The problem comes from people who are different in race, language, religion, ethnicity, trying to share the same territory. Look at Great Britain, look at France, look at Sweden. They have massive terror, crime, and disorder problems and cultural assimilation problems for one reason. They imported a bunch of people from a part of the world that doesn't share their values. Look at the history of multiracial nations. It's a history of conflict, it's a history of distrust, and it's ultimately a history of blood and tears. Latin American countries are changing election outcomes here by forcing demographic change on this country at a rate that American voters consistently say they don't want. It sounds to me like we got a problem uh, with people who got here legally uh, uh, altering the, uh, the landscape politically. I don't like it. Fuck you. Stop it. And notice where this change is not happening. Any place our leaders live. They caused all of this with their reckless immigration policies, and yet their own neighborhoods are basically unchanged. They look like it's 1960. No demographic change at all in their zip codes. Our leaders are for diversity, just not where they live. I find, frankly, the kind of hypocrisy expressed by these alleged champions of diversity to be quite contemptible. They themselves can live in a way to insulate themselves from the brute strangeness of people that don't speak English or whose religion and culture are drastically different from theirs. Hazleton's population was 2% Hispanic. Just 16 years later, Hazleton is majority Hispanic. That's a lot of change. 
People who grew up in Hazleton return to find out they can't communicate with the people who now live there. And that's bewildering for people. That's happening all over the country. There is a campaign to make European Americans a minority in this country. Their goal is to change your country forever, and they're succeeding, by the way. We are being systematically and deliberately replaced. You're a beneficiary of white privilege. Would that be hate speech? I'm attacking you because of your membership in a group. It could incite violence. White privilege being taught at universities, which is meant to build up a stigma build up hatred and potentially pave the way for violence against white people. As Vice.com succinctly put it a couple of years ago, quote, it is literally impossible to be racist to a white person. Pretty much the entire left now takes that as a matter of faith. They deeply believe that. But what does that mean exactly? But the real racism today is not by white people. It's against white people. Terrorism may be bad, but raising doubts about multiculturalism is worse. Foreigners come to our countries and kill our people. You'd think our leaders would blame them, but no, they blame us who live here. They blame our history, they blame our culture, our opinions, our religion. It's our fault. That is their core assumption, and you see it in all they say. Let me remind you that this isn't some fringe YouTuber. This isn't some, you know, Twitter account. This isn't some poster on the Daily Stormer message boards. This is a national news icon who has the most popular news show in america and what he says sounds indistinguishable from neo-nazis and when he addressed the backlash that he knew he'd trigger on his program uh, on monday guess what he did knowing that there'd be no consequences he doubled down and proceeded to laugh at the folks who were correctly and justifiably mad at what he said at least one prediction came true right away. All those little gatekeepers on Twitter did become hysterical. They spent the last four days jumping up and down, furiously trying once again to pull the show off the air. Once again, they will fail, though it is amusing to see them keep at it. They get so enraged. It's a riot. But why all the anger? If someone says something you think is wrong, is your first instinct to hurt them? Probably not. Normal people don't respond that way. If you hear something you think is incorrect, you try to correct it. But getting the facts right is hardly the point of this exercise. The point is to prevent unauthorized conversations from starting in the first place. Shut up, racist, no more questions. You've heard that before. You wonder how much longer they imagine Americans are gonna go along with this. An entire country forced to lie about everything all the time. It can't go on forever, but you can see why they're trying it. Demographic change is the key to the Democratic Party's political ambitions. Let's say that again for emphasis because it is the secret to the entire immigration debate. Demographic change is the key to the Democratic Party's political ambitions. In order to win and maintain power, Democrats plan to change the population of the country. They're no longer trying to win you over with their program. They're obviously not trying to improve your life. They don't even really care about your vote anymore. Their goal is to make you irrelevant. So this is the most dangerous pundit in all of America. Fox knows that if they get rid of him, he's popular. That's going to hurt their ratings. And also, when they see OAN and Newsmax out crazying them, appealing more and more to the far right and even white supremacists, they know they at least need to have one pundit on their program that is going to appeal to that group if they want to keep making money. And again, this is not a news organization. It's a business. So that's why Tucker Carlson can uh, say explicitly white supremacist conspiracy theories and use white supremacist rhetoric. And advertisers at this point, they're just like, yeah, I mean, it's Tucker. That's where the eyeballs are. So that's where we're going to advertise. No repercussions whatsoever. Every single night, he is feeding white supremacist ideas to millions and millions of people. Think about the long-term damage that this causes to our country. And he's also incredibly strategic. He's already co-opted individuals on the left who might critique him. Every once in a while, he'll pepper in a critique against billionaires and maybe he'll bring on a leftist or two and make it seem as if he's on your side. He might talk about how war is bad once in a while, even though he supported the Iraq war and we all know he's lying, but people are falling for it. People are getting duped by his propaganda, and leftists are getting co-opted because they see that sometimes he's anti-war, 
Sometimes he's against the corporations and the establishment, so he must not be that bad. And if he says white supremacist things once in a while, I guess that's the price we've got to pay if he's going to talk about how bad corporate America is. This is all part of a strategy to make white supremacy and white supremacist propaganda more digestible to conservative normies, to a broader audience. And guess what? It is working. So, I mean, if you are able to watch that clip and still defend Tucker Carlson and think, well, I don't know what the problem is with this guy. Sure, I disagree with him right there. But, you know, uh, he, he talks about how war is bad sometimes. You are being duped. Don't be a useful idiot for Tucker Carlson. He has an agenda, and he doesn't just know how to effectively sell that agenda. He knows how to reach across the aisle and speak to folks who otherwise wouldn't necessarily be inclined to listen to a Fox News host by speaking populist language sometimes. But it's all a fucking gimmick. It's all a ruse to get everyone more comfortable with white supremacy. And he's already won.